Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Nathaniel Miller from the University of Northern Colorado. Um, and um, we're going to be talking about a mentoring program uh, that I've been running at University of Northern Colorado over the last six years, uh, teaching people to teach an inquiry-based college geometry class. Uh, these are the last three mentorees, um, two of whom have just recently become doctors uh, last month. We have Dr. Uh, Lee Robertson, Sarah Rosner, and Dr. Becky Ann Dibbs. Um, and uh, so we're each going to be talking a little bit about the uh, mentoring experience from each of our perspectives and talking about some different aspects of it. Um, so you should know that the University of Northern Colorado started out as the Colorado State Normal School, so it has a focus on preparing teachers at all levels. Um, so the um, undergraduate course that we're going to be talking about is a college geometry course mainly directed towards pre-service teachers. Um, we also have a PhD program in math ed, that's uh, where these guys came from. Uh, and the hope is that they'll be able to then go out and get jobs in other places where they're going to have to teach these kinds of courses and be well prepared um, to do so. Uh, and certainly the way that I learned to teach in an inquiry-based uh, way was through mentoring when I myself was in graduate school. So um, it seems to be a good way to do this. Uh, the course that we're going to be talking about um, is an undergraduate um, geometry course that's taught in um, with a lot of group work, um, a lot of written assignments that get revised, maybe similar to some of the kinds of uh, courses that were talked about uh, in the plenary talk. Um, but so we're just going to go down and each person is going to talk about some different things and then at the end we'll kind of have a discussion about some, some things that we uh, all want to talk about. So first, uh, Dr. Lee Robertson is going to uh, speak. Um, so what I'm looking, going to talk to you about today is a little bit about the course design, course structure, and also um, introducing the students into the culture of the course, and actually get the socialization into the course as well. Um, so just a little more information on the course. Um, we generally have students working in groups of three to four. Um, the course is with their small group discussions and class discussions that are either led by the students or us as instructors. Um, the course itself is a series of eight to ten problems, but the, the problems are give a chance to, for students to really get deep into the problems and work on and figure out on their own. And it's a course that students generally like for the fact that we say the material that they get from our course notes is all the material they get. They don't have to go buy a book, which they always get to celebrate <laughs> on that regard, which um, a lot of you will understand that. And one thing with this course also is it's a series of, like I said, eight to 10 questions. So students are not quite used to working in small groups sometimes, and let alone getting up and presenting their work in front of other students. So as an instructor, you, we really have to work on bringing the students into the culture of the class and also the culture of mathematics because how often for students is algebra or something very similar procedural is their only understanding of mathematics to think, I just follow this series of steps and this is what mathematics is. Things will just come out and work nice if I pick the right step, right algorithm, right formula to work with. Um, and this is a completely different, um, unique experience for them, a new experience um, that they are unfamiliar with. And so really setting up those expectations, letting them know that, hey, math is a creative subject that you can really work on. And like some of those questions that we ask are just starting with basic um, axioms and say, okay, what can you build from this knowledge? Mathematics is something you can actually build new knowledge from. and that shocks a lot of students actually, which is kind of strange thinking we've had so many years of, of some math and thinking that, hey, you can actually build new mathematical knowledge. Um, so really working on that, like math is more than just a set of procedures and steps, works with that. Um, and also um, managing the frustrations that comes out of sometimes you don't know the answer and you have to talk and ask about it. It's something that the unknown is very scary for some of them, so let them know that it's okay to work with that. Um, but there's many problems that do come up with this. 
some that you, you'll find out as an instructor, and Sarah's going to give you a little bit more detail on some of those problems that you might encounter that first time you really start working in this inquiry-based instruction. Thanks, Lee. So I wanted to talk with you a little bit about getting started with IBL. For most of us, this was our first time teaching an IBL course, and so things were a little bit different. So I remember sitting down with the notes and trying to work problems so I could essentially build my content knowledge. Because for me, I hadn't had geometry in a while, so it had been a little daunting um, getting started. And I also went through and read, so each of us wrote a paper at the end of our mentoring experience. So I went through and read papers that other people who had gone through this program um, had written, as well as I talked with Lee. And so, as I read through these papers, it pretty much just said, sometimes we wrote down the questions that Dr. Miller asked, and it didn't necessarily help a ton. So the mentorship was actually a pretty wonderful experience because we had the chance to kind of start small and build our way up. Uh, when we first started the mentorship, we mostly, I mostly acted like a shadow. So I followed Dr. Miller, I listened to what he said, I saw how he interacted with students, and then I took notes and asked him questions after class. After each class, we'd typically have a debriefing session. Um, somewhere along the way, we taught a couple lessons and got some feedback. So I remember being pretty fortunate to have both Dr. Miller and Lee in the room, so I got double the feedback, which was quite wonderful. Um, we also had a chance to start off by reading the comments Dr. Miller had used. So in this class, there were two types of assignments. One of the assignments was an informal assignment. And students had the chance to kind of resubmit these assignments until they had perfected it. Um, so we provided lots of feedback to the students. And when we first started, Dr. Miller did most of the grading, which gave us the opportunity to read his comments, see the types of things he made comments about, and then slowly start inserting our comments. So at the beginning of the semester, he did most of the grading, and it transitioned to the end of the semester, us doing most of the grading. And I think this was a really nice way to sort of get us prepared, because in the spring semester, we actually were responsible for teaching a class. And so it sort of worked in the reverse. We still were responsible for all of the grading, except we were taught most of the lessons, and an occasional few Dr. Miller came in. So we could see how he interacted with our students, as well as things that he maybe had done in terms of pacing. Um, I think one of the biggest things from this is that you just kind of have to step in and get your feet wet. So I know one of the biggest things that I struggled with when we first started teaching lessons was making sure that I got around to different students um, and not necessarily talk with each group. So it was sort of a nice experience in terms of how we learned. And I'm actually going to let Becky Ann talk with you a little bit more about Dr. Becky Ann Dibbs talk with you about decision making in the classroom. Yeah. Well, my background is in competitive forensics. And so I came from a very set place in my mentorship was that I couldn't wait to learn how to do group work because I was already so good at lectures and, well, maybe I could learn something from this. And so what I realized very quickly in class was that all of the skills I had learned were almost totally useless for IBL. And where when I was lecturing, I could get in there and essentially almost all of the teaching decisions for that day I'd made before I started. And in this IBL class, now I have to make decisions constantly. Did, did I say enough to this group? Does this group have enough help to be okay for another 15 minutes? Do I need to stop at this group or not? Have, are enough groups stuck in the same place that we need to talk together? And so it's constantly thinking and constantly planning, but none of that can be done before I see where the students actually are. So basically my entire mentoring experience was learning the stove was hot. So I, Dr. Miller would tell me, you know, this is probably what you should try. Lee and Sarah would tell me this is probably what you should try, and then I would ignore them, and it wouldn't work, and then I'd try their thing, and then it would. 
So my first lesson, I wrote out a beautiful lesson plan of the student's trajectory through the problem, where they'd get stuck, what, what we would talk about. And sure enough, right, I had predicted where they got stuck the first time, about as far in. And then I misread my lesson plan, launched into a beautiful, coherent discussion of something they were going to get stuck on about an hour and a half from that. Didn't work. Fortunately, what, what I learned about teaching, especially coming back the next day and starting over again in IBL, is that it's okay if I'm not perfect. And the students are remarkably resilient to it. That while I was really helpful to bail them out, to manage frustration and sometimes to get groups talking to each other so they could move forward, I wasn't the central part of the process. And that was probably the biggest thing I learned in teaching was that my students got further learned more deeply and learned more when I wasn't the center of the classroom. But I think ultimately, as far as learning to teach in this kind of project-based, inquiry-based learning, the only way I, I was able to learn to teach it was in an inquiry-based way. Is, is this my, oh, okay, good. Um, say, say more about what you mean by that. So, I guess what I mean is we would, I didn't know how to, I didn't know the answer. I would very often ask you for the answer and the right way to do things and you would ask me leading questions. And it really wasn't until I sat down to start writing my paper a few weeks ago that I realized that that was exactly the way we got the students to finally prove their theorems. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's another way to teach somebody to teach this way than to let them try it and then help them with what actually happens. Um, so the class is inquiry-based, the mentoring is inquiry-based, the... It's like learning to ride a bicycle. You just keep falling over and he keeps telling you get up and try again. And you know what, you get up and keep trying again and you get the joy of riding. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I would definitely say to anyone who is thinking about uh, teaching in an inquiry-based way for the first time that uh, finding somebody to, to help uh, mentor you is, um, is huge. Um, it makes a really big difference. Um, I think everyone here would agree that if uh, you've just been dropped into this course <laughs> with, without any preparation that... It would not have gone well. It would not have gone well. Um, Okay, well, so then uh, I wanted to ask e each of you, um, so what were the most rewarding things from the mentoring program? What were the biggest challenges? And, and what advice would you have to give to anyone out there who was thinking about teaching a course like this for the first time? Um, I'll go first. Um, biggest challenge is, again, the idea of buy, getting the students to kind of buy into the culture that is inquiry-based learning, getting them to explain why and their frustrations that arise from, why do you keep asking me the question, that same question? Um, and then the feeling of failure sometimes that you get because you don't necessarily think the class went well um, and getting used to that failure. And, but always just saying, well, next day will be better, next day will be better, and then you slowly see that change happen in the students and it happens in you as the teacher as well. It, it becomes the most rewarding part as well. Um, hearing students say, oh, you know what, I, we had a history major in one class, and it's like, I use the same strategy when I write my history papers now. I think, what did I start with, and why do I feel this way in my paper? So just hearing that from a, from a student is incredibly rewarding. So getting over that failure and seeing that improvement in, your, in myself and the students was awesome. Yeah, and I think I'd like to add to that a little bit. I think one of the greatest rewards was seeing students actually excited to come to class. So at the end of the semester, we dedicate three, maybe four weeks to a final project where students get to investigate cones and they get to kind of pick what that topic looks like and so it's fun to see them sort of take off and actually enjoy it and really make some nice progress and develop proofs. Um, so I think that was one of the biggest strengths. Um, in terms of challenges, I'd say that managing student frustrations is one of the bigger ones for me. I had students who got mad and walked out of class. I had students who sort of swore in class 
and it was sort of a balance of essentially trying to figure out how authoritative I needed to be, when did I need to take control of discussions and tell them more. Um, so student frustration. In terms of advice, if you go through some sort of mentorship, you're not going to be good at everything. You can only work on a couple things at a time. So that's probably my biggest advice. Know that you have things to work on. You're going to fall off the bike a lot of times, like Lee would say. But pick a couple things, work on those, and once you feel like you've mastered them, pick something else to work on. Yeah. So my, I think I had two very major challenges. One was letting go of my control freak tendencies. And the other was in the first semester when Dr. Miller and I were teaching the class, we had half of our class were English language learners. So trying to find groups and ways that could support their learning without having students working in the same groups every time was pretty challenging. The biggest reward for me for this mentorship process was how the class is different every time. So each semester we're in there, the students uh, learning things in different ways, they're presenting different solutions, and they take different paths through the problems. And in fact, in the Cone Project Sarah mentioned, one of my groups last semester chose to do a project that Dr. Miller had never seen before. So even as many times as he's taught it, students can still surprise us. And that was something I really found exciting about teaching this class. Uh, yeah, one of, I, I would say that um, one of the great things about inquiry-based teaching is that um, well, when you do have a different class, you can't do it the same way. Um, you know, we had lots of different kinds of classes that um, actually uh, both Lee and Sarah have gotten to teach the course again after they did the mentorship. So they've taught uh, each, I guess, the course of twice. Taught, taught it with me twice, taught, taught it, watched me teach it once and then taught it themselves twice. And yeah. um, I don't know, do you guys have more comments about the differences between, between different classes and how you adapt? Uh, of course, but uh, what I'm, one thing I wanted, wanted to say was that, you know, it, it's actually, it's a feature, it's not a bug that, that you have to do it differently when you have a class that's half English language, you know, students from Thailand. Uh, which we suddenly had because uh, our university has an exchange program with a university in Thailand, um, or Sarah's giant class that had some very, very frustrated students in it <laughs> because of their personalities. Um, you know, they were just, or the class that Lee was in that had half minors who were from all different uh, subjects. Well, it makes, that's actually one of the best features because you could teach the same class I don't know, five, six times, and it seems new every time. And it also makes it, it's also fun to be like mentally challenged when you teach. I mean, how many times if you've been up in lecture, do you feel like you're just kind of going through the motions? But when you're actually in there and like asking students questions and hearing new questions or new ideas that you maybe never thought of before, I mean, that's super rewarding. That's exactly why we love math, is because new ideas keep popping out from people just looking at di different angles. So, did, did you actually think that the, when it was first happening, when you were in charge of the um, class? After I wanted to or pull my hair scared? out a few times. <laughs> yeah. Um, after mentally drained but, um, and frustrated, but you step back and you look back at the experiences and you're like, yeah, that was good. But. I think the other advantage to having taught it twice, so I had a class of about 22 and a, with frustrated students, and then I had a class of about 10. And my class of 22, that was when I was working with Dr. Miller, and my students were mostly secondary majors. So their background was a lot different than my spring semester this past year, where I had 10 students who were mostly math minors. Um, so their needs were a little bit different. And I know that pacing had to be different because we sometimes had to spend more time in the beginning trying to establish some of the norms. I know for myself, when I was working with Dr. Miller, one of my struggles was getting around to the groups in a timely fashion, or rather not going to some groups. And in my class of 10, I found it a little bit harder to have group discussions, which was something I had worked so hard to facilitate in the previous year because I had more students and there really wasn't an option. In fact, I kept telling myself, 
because this came from Dr. Miller, if you have to tell two groups, then you need to have a class discussion. But when you only have three groups, my mentality sort of shifted to, well, I can just talk to the third group. So that was one of the differences that I noticed. And that had to do a little bit with students and their abilities, as well as me and struggling through things. But on the really bad days, I could talk to Lee or Becky Ann or Dr. Miller. And so the support system was really a vital piece for me because Lee needed to remind me a couple times that it was going to be okay. Bad days can be recovered from and the students were still learning, which is what really mattered. Oh, I never taught the course twice, so I yeah. don't know what I can add. Well, so, so here's a follow-up question as you guys were talking. Um, has this experience changed your other teaching? You've had to teach a lot of other courses. Oh, since then, has it? Well, I'm, the two courses I'm teaching this summer are flipped. I've taught both courses before as lecture, but especially with a shorter class, I wanted to make sure that what topics we could cover in a shorter cl class, we covered more deeply. So the students are doing a lot more work and talking to each other. So, yeah. I mean, I would have to agree as well. I think I certainly think about the types of questions I'm asking a little bit more, as well as just not necessarily just asking a question, but thinking about the purpose. So asking a question didn't mean you just wanted an answer. Sometimes it meant you wanted to have the opportunity to interact with your students a little bit more and get to know them better. And I'll say it's definitely done it for me. Um, seeing that, like I said, that shift in understanding what mathematics is. I'm, I've taught uh, quite a few elementary education mathematics courses and getting those elementary teachers to understand that math is more than just what they are going to see in that class so that they can pass that on. Um, having them think about building new knowledge, using like some simple ideas that we've had taken from that class, having small little accents, building new things. Um, and hopefully where they can take that into their own classrooms, that understanding that mathematics is you have to explain why. You need to think about the reasoning. Think about a system. Don't just be random in your thoughts. Um, all those like big ideas that, that we try to get our students to take away from inquiry-based learning, trying to help instill that into our elementary math teachers because if we can get our students to start thinking of that at the elementary level, hopefully it'll push their teachers as well and hopefully they'll come up and we'll have more creative discussions when they come to my class later on. They'll have new ideas that I have never heard of, so. Okay, well, great. Um, I just wanted to mention that the notes for these classes, if you're interested, uh, they're both published in the Journal of Inquiry-Based Learning and Mathematics, so if you're interested in seeing more of the materials that we used, uh, those are there. Uh, and I think at this point we'll open up for any questions from anyone in the audience. Hi, uh, thank you for the panel. Since um, this method of teaching is new to you, I wonder if you could speak to what you've learned about how learning works, or what is inquiry-based learning, and why is this a productive method? I mean, you've talked a lot about teaching. I guess I'm trying to help understand why you're making these teaching decisions that you're making. What have you learned about how learning works in an inquiry-based classroom? I, I think for my students, where they did their most learning was in their revision. So they got a good start in class, they wrote their first paper, and where they really dug into that concept and where they finally really took ownership of the material was when they had to revise and explain it well enough that another classmate could read their paper without answer, asking questions. And I'll say through um, the cognitive conflict that they get, say if it's something very simple, then are they actually, and they can just answer it right away, how much are they actually learning? But if they're actually struggling through the process, and then as Becky Ann talked about their revision, a lot of times if they see another student's perspective on it, which is built into the inquiry base, like, like all of a sudden they're like, oh, I have a new idea, a new approach. So just start thinking about multiple approaches to a problem and new ideas. Um, that's where I saw a lot of learning, where they just overcome a challenge and see, or just all of a sudden someone puts a new idea in their head and they're ready to run with it. Any other questions?
Well, I wrote down a lot of questions, but um, one I was wondering, um, one of you mentioned sort of building your own content knowledge in this area while being mentored in teaching this, and I was wondering if the rest of you had similar experiences in how you approach that as the mentor and as the mentee, building your own content knowledge of geometry when it may be something you haven't done in a long time. Well, I was the one who originally said that. Um, it had been. Well, I think everyone had that same experience to a certain extent. Yeah, Sarah was kind enough to warn me about that, so I wound up going through the problems for the classes in the summer and then, you know, cornering her and asking her questions and whether or not I'd done it right. So Sarah was nice enough to, you know, help me with the revision process my students eventually had to do. And that pedagogy of content knowledge or the knowledge about teaching that subject in geometry, um, the second time through, like, all of a sudden, like, there's opportunities that you realize you missed the first time to, like, possibly take this into a new direction or something. And when that opportunity comes at next time, like, you can just go with it. And the content knowledge that you've got built in allows you to really expand the class um, and what they're going to see as well. So you can actually use your previous class's content knowledge that they built to expand your current classes. So you can just keep building classes bigger and bigger. But I do think that um, any time that you are teaching a course like this, you are going to be learning some of the content as you're teaching it. Um, you know, even if it's a subject that you did know well, you'd still be learning some of it as it went on because you're responding to what the students are doing, and what the students are doing is not the same from semester to semester. As Becky Ann mentioned, you know, last semester, you know, in the final project, we had a group working on the same project that I've done, I don't know, I lost count of how many times I've taught this course, um, but you know, they're still coming up with new ideas and things that I haven't seen before that I have to react to on the fly. So uh, in a way, not knowing all the content and ahead of time, uh, I think it's actually less of a problem than the not having the pedagogical content knowledge, right? Not knowing how they're going to react, what, where they're going to get stuck. That, that's harder to, to get. The, the content, you're probably, you know, if you're here, you're probably able to pick up the content pretty fast yourself on the fly. You're used to doing that. But the, uh, the pedagogical content knowledge you can only get by trying it out and seeing what happens. And giving up control of the classroom, that's where you'll get to build new knowledge as well. Is this the only course that you do a mentor for? Or are you thinking about doing it in other courses? Uh, well, this is the only one that I've done this kind of formal mentoring for. Uh, you know, we had a grant to do it, um, and you know, it's very time intensive. So you know, I was working one on one with each of these people for a year. Um, so I, I have you know, done more informal mentoring with other courses. I have some course notes for some other courses that I've helped people with. But um, uh, I, you know, I think if there's any kind of course that you're looking to, to teach, there are people here at this conference probably who would like to help you out with it. So whatever it is, there's probably somebody who's done it. Uh, OK, well, thank you all very much. Uh, it's a pleasure being here.